We have about a minute to go, but uh, I'll just uh, introduce myself real quick. My name is Professor Hayat Alvi. I'm a civilian academic in the NSA Department, National Security Affairs. Welcome to the Lecture of Opportunity on Afghanistan, the events in Afghanistan. I do see 12 o'clock now, so we'll officially get started. Uh, thank you all for joining us today um, to hear this panel uh, of very esteemed scholars. Uh, here's the format. We will begin with uh, Professor Jim Cook and then Professor Rabia uh, Zafar and Professor Nick Gazdev. Each speaker will speak for between 10 to 15 minutes. This will be followed by the Q&A session. Just a couple of quick notes. This is being recorded, and once we get to the Q&A session, the recording will uh, be stopped. You can, uh, you can start putting your questions in the chat uh, as we go along, and I will be screening the Q&A questions. And if you have a specific panelist you want to direct a question to, please make sure you indicate that in your uh, question posted in the chat. Uh, and one last thing, uh, I have to give the official disclaimer, which is that everything that the panelists and I say during the presentations and Q&A of this lecture of opportunity represents each person's personal views and not those of the Department of Defense or the Department of the Navy. So with that, thank you again for joining us. We will begin with Professor Jim Cook. Thanks, Hyatt. Um, my name is Professor Jim Cook. I'm a professor of National Security Affairs. Uh, but in addition to, uh, to writing about and examining Afghanistan, I'm, I'm also a practitioner in that I'm a retired Army officer who served three tours of duty in Afghanistan. Um, and so what I want to talk about is kind of the uh, the military aspects of the of the conflict, um, and I think it's especially important because in in the aftermath of the loss of 13 U.S. service members following last week's suicide bombing at, at H. Kaya, President Biden said that there will be a time for addressing criticism and self-examination later. Well, when that time comes, one of the many questions that senior U.S. leaders and policymakers will have to address is why did the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces, or the ANDSF, fail to fight for their country? And this is an especially important question because Biden's withdrawal plan relied on the 300,000 ANDSF troops that were, quote, well-equipped, as well-equipped as any army in the world, and supported by the Afghan Air Force. After all, the United States invested some $83 billion in creating and maintaining this force. But given the unexpected speed and success of the Taliban's offensive across the country, his faith in their capability seemed misplaced and wildly optimistic, if not completely delusional in retrospect. During the Taliban's lightning fast offensive where one provincial capital after another fell over an 11 day period, a clearly frustrated Pentagon spokesman John Kirby told reporters that this is their country. These are their military forces. These are their provincial capitals, their people to defend. And it's really gonna come down to the leadership that they're willing to exude here at this particular moment. But despite the administration's demands, it appears that the Taliban simply weren't challenged on the battlefield. Instead, local and national commanders negotiated surrender deals with the Taliban in exchange for money and security guarantees at the expense of the country. And of course, this leads to the all important question, why? Well, as many things with this conflict, the answer is complicated. First, the argument that the ANDSF did not fight for their country is simply incorrect, as over 66,000 were killed over the course of the 20-year conflict. That said, one can make a distinction between the sacrifice that the ANDSF made over the years and its performance, or lack thereof, during the, final, during the Taliban's final offensive and end endgame for the Afghan government. The notion that a well-trained and equipped Afghan security force would simply melt away reflects the lack of faith in the Afghan government's leadership 
and the poor state of morale, exacerbated by the hasty withdrawal of U.S. troops and critical enablers, such as close air support and logistics. The fledgling Afghan Air Force was overwhelmed by calls to support Afghan forces, while the simultaneous removal of U.S. defense contractors, required by the bilateral Afghan peace agreement between the U.S. and the Taliban, simply decimated their maintenance capabilities. In fact, some have argued that the U.S. termination of its longstanding support actually helped pave the way for the Taliban's return to power. Thus, while the aggregate troop numbers would suggest that Kabul held the upper hand, this episode demonstrates the psychological impact on a, on a numerically superior force against a determined energy, an enemy, and a stark reminder that wars are simply not fought on paper. Moreover, the peace agreement prohibited the Taliban from attacking U.S. or coalition troops, while the ANDSF was not afforded this protection. It's also worth remembering that this agreement did not include the Afghan government in Kabul. They sent a clear signal to the ANDSF about U.S. priorities and intentions. Afghans are pragmatic and could see the direction of U.S. support. Unsurprisingly, the Taliban targeted the ANDSF that paid a horrible price in casualties while the Taliban correctly claimed that they were still adhering to the peace deal. I strongly recommend that you, re that you read the recent New York Times op-ed authored by Lieutenant General Sami Sadat, who commanded the 215th Maywan Corps in Helmand Province before being ordered at the last minute to secure Kabul, an impossible task. Sadat wrote, emotionally but accurately, about the sense of betrayal he felt from both U.S. and Afghan government. He brings the credibility of someone who had to endure the agonizing impact of decisions made in Washington and Kabul on the ground as he fought for his country. Unfortunately, the surrendering of Afghan security forces included the transfer of U.S. provided vehicles and weapon systems, making the Taliban an even stronger and more capable fighting force. Additionally, major bases in Afghanistan, such as Bagram Air Airfield, were turned over the to the Taliban without resistance. Worse, Bagram also houses the Parwan prison, and an estimated 5,000 to 7,000 prisoners were released, including hardened Taliban fighters, but also presumably members of Al-Qaeda and maybe ISIS in the Karzan province, or ISIS-K. Now, all of this is profoundly disappointing for those of us that helped create, train, equip, and fund the Afghan National Security and Defense Forces. That said, I want to make clear that the Afghan government and security forces have some agency here, and Biden used their lack of willingness to fight as a reason to double down on his decision to withdraw, essentially saying that we cannot want it more than them, and that another year in Afghanistan would not have made a difference. But while this may be true, it does not excuse the chaos created by the horrendous and tragic way the U.S. withdrew from the country. Now, I'll close with my belief that the original sin in all of this is the 2002 Bonn Agreement that paved the way for U.S. defeat in Afghanistan, as we never really matched our lofty goals with the necessary resources. The agreement called for the creation of a central government in an historically tribal country as well as a Western-style military under the control of that government instead of a more decentralized system of security. In essence, we replaced the traditional warlord and militia structure with a more centralized system that would turn out to be an enormous effort in both frustration and futility. Over the years, we stood up Task Force Phoenix and the Combined Security Transition Command Afghanistan, or CSTICA, that created and maintained a large military organization that included the Ministry of Defense and the Afghan National Army with its seven corps, special operations, and even an Air Force. In addition to generating security forces, however, this massive enterprise was riddled with bureaucracy and corruption. Worse, we created an army in our image, one that relied on sophisticated equipment and technical, technical support that would prove simply unsustainable without that continued U.S. support. The Sami Sadat op-ed explains this particular aspect in some detail. Now, while all of this was occurring, the Taliban had reconstituted as a fighting force following the initial U.S. invasion and was waging a growing insurgency against the newly formed government in Kabul 
and U.S. and coalition forces. In response to the growing insurgent threat, then President Obama announced the surge of 100,000 troops that also included an 18-month deadline to begin a withdrawal of those same forces. Now, while this calendar-driven approach was domestically and politically popular, it sent the Taliban a message that they could simply wait out the United States. So the Obama administration ended the U.S. combat mission in Afghanistan at the end of 2014 and turned over the major fighting to Afghan security forces. This allowed the U.S. to significantly reduce its military footprint in the country. To facilitate this transition, NATO's International Security Assistance Force, or ISAF, stood down and was replaced by Operation Resolute Support that focused on a train, advise, and assist mission for the AMDSF. And while the surge certainly weakened the Taliban, what followed was a relative stalemate where the Taliban was slowly able to gain and expand influence in the rural areas of the country, while the ANDSF focused on protecting the more populated areas. Of course, that stalemate ended with the termination of Operation Resolute Support in July, along with the subsequent U.S. and Coalition Air Logistics Intelligence Support. Simply put, the ANDSF saw the writing on the wall. Their government was cut out of the bilateral U.S. peace deal with the Taliban, and the coalition drew down its military footprint and eventually cut off all support. In response, Afghan political and military leaders cut deals with the Taliban, and even some fled the country. So the question is, why would ANDSF soldiers fight and die for their countries when their leaders would not? Over time, America's view of Afghanistan went from the good war to the forgotten war and a forever war that spanned two decades. I don't need to tell this audience that some of the children of Afghan veterans were sent to the same combat theater as their parents. Moreover, the forever wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were and are unpopular among the American public. A recent public opinion poll conducted earlier this month showed that some 60% of the public still thinks those wars were not worth fighting. Contrast that with polls taken at the beginning of the conflict that showed overwhelming support 88 plus percent for the good war. Now, the Afghans have a saying that you Americans have the watches, but we have the time. And, and that seems quite a prescient observation today. The phrase points out that even though the U.S. has technology, the watches, on their side, time is ultimately on their side because Washington simply lacks the political will to remain Afga in Afghanistan indefinitely and will eventually leave. It also means that the Taliban could afford to be patient and wait until the time was right to strike. And that's exactly what they did. So while the national attention and bandwidth are rightfully focused on completing the U.S. evacuation from Kabul, there are serious longer term challenges that must be addressed. First and foremost, will this be a repeat of the U.S. withdrawal from Iraq in 2011? that saw the rise of ISIS and necessitated the return of U.S. troops? Initial indications are not positive, and I'm happy to discuss this or other issues during the question and answer period. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Cook. And now we turn to Professor Rabia Zafar. Thank you so much, Hayat. Um, I'm Rabia Zafar. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at, uh, in NSA. Uh, my research is on the incentives for extremist violence, and which is what I'll be talking uh, about today. Um, I've conducted field research in Pakistan and have also served as an intelligence officer at the Defense Intelligence Agency. Um, I'd like to preface my comments today by acknowledging the fact that much of the analysis that we are seeing, um, especially in the popular press, is devoid of Afghan voices. Um, that doesn't necessarily make it incorrect, uh, but it does make it incomplete. Um, and by that metric, what I'll present to you today um, is, is in many ways incomplete. Um, I've tried my best um, through uh, phone interviews in the past week or so with people um, in the region, in Pakistan, um, mostly to kind of fill this gap a little bit. Um, these are people with on the ground knowledge who speak Pashto, who have sources within Afghanistan. Um, so I've tried that um, and also based some of my analysis on reporting um, from journalists currently inside Kabul. 
Um, so like I said, I'll focus my comments on extremist violence and the current and future incentives uh, for this type of violence in Afghanistan. As we saw from the heartbreaking breaking events uh, in the past week at Kabul airport, incentives for extremist violence um, are high, right? And I believe they will continue to rise unless there is um, some sort of major exogenous shock to the incentive structures um, that are beginning to take root. But why are these incentive structures taking root, these particular incentive structures? Uh, what is actually contributing to the rise of um, the rising incentives for extremist violence? I believe that there are three uh, related and overarching factors. Number one, I think there's a great deal of uncertainty, right? So people have described this as a political vacuum, but more precisely, I believe that the problem is a bureaucratic vacuum, an uncertainty of resource allocations, uh, resources of all types are up for grabs. And by resources, I, I'm talking firstly about um, official state resources, right? Who controls jobs, building contracts, who gets to collect tax revenue, um, who are the new patrons? And I use that term very meaningfully, patrons, um, because there were definitely old patrons, right? The idea that at any point uh, in the past 20 years, or even before, the Afghan government was a formalized, regularized, regularized system of governance is, is a little bit of make-believe. There were informal, irregular mechanisms of governance in place throughout this period and, and prior, of course. Um, officials in the Afghan government acted in unofficial capacities, um, and service provision and access to basic governance uh, was at least partially dispensed with, within patronage-based systems. But those patrons no longer exist. And that really is the vacuum, that's the gap. Secondly, by resources, I mean illegal funding streams, criminal rackets, extortion rackets. Um, and then um, very practically, the houses, property, businesses of former Afghan uh, government officials, political elites, those are all up for grabs. There have been reports um, coming out of Afghanistan about criminals showing up um, to places demanding property, knowing that some people have two or three cars and, and saying, give over the keys, give over payment. In some places, those people are saying that they are Taliban, and in others, um, they're saying that they're ISIS, ISIS-K or Daesh, or also known as ISIS-KP, ISIS uh, Islamic State Khorasan Province. Um, and how do we know that they're criminals and not actually either ISIS or, or Taliban uh, fighters? It's because the locals are telling us this is the case. Right? The locals are saying, well, we know that this person was a criminal um, gang member or, or an extortionist, and now they're positioning themselves as um, Taliban linked or ISIS K linked. So all this to say is that this uncertainty is what's heightening incentives for extremist violence. Claimants, potential patrons, are trying to establish legitimacy and credibility. They need to first be able to physically secure and ma maintain control of these resources, and then they need to show potential clients that they have the street credibility deliver, deliver the services, meet the needs of ordinary Afghans who are there. The second factor that I believe is raising incentives for extremist violence is ironically a desire for Taliban to be seen as a legitimate government, right? So Taliban officials have given assurances to the Chinese, for example, that Uyghurs, Uzbeks, Tajiks will not be given safe haven in Afghanistan. They've made assurances to the international community that women's rights will be protected under the confines of Sharia, Sharia law. I'm not saying that I believe the Taliban, but what I am saying is that this, these kind of concessions give um, ISIS-K an in. It gives them a way to define themselves in contrast to the Taliban, who they're now painting as the newer, uh, more bearded version of the Afghan government, right? So there've been videos circulating of um, Taliban fighters dancing in the streets, doing, uh, you know, doing the traditional Afghan uh, Patan dance, uh, Pashtun dance, and, and they're showing these videos as evidence of um, the Taliban's lack of Islamic credentials. When this telling the Taliban is the new establishment, and ISIS-K is the opposition, the rebels who are going to bring true Islamic rule, uh, Islamic governance to Afghanistan. This is a dangerous dynamic that's being created because it forces uh, the Taliban, it forces um, them to kind of engage in this religious outbidding with ISIS-K to prove themselves, religious or extremist outbidding, to really prove their, their credentials. 
And to be clear, this is not ideology. These are incentives, it's incentive driven. So the enforcement of social codes like dress, social codes like dress, beards, um, banning music, these all provide opportunities for money making, for exerting authority in a very public way, right? And this has always been the case. It's always been the purview of these low level members of these groups. This is how you get the 20 something year old Taliban fighter um, something to do, to endow them with a sense of authority, power and income, very importantly, um, to otherwise unskilled labor. So this enforcing of burqas and beards with a whip in particular is empowering um, and profitable for these young uneducated men. The third factor um, is a bit of a wild card. It's a potential factor that could raise incentives for extremist violence and that's Pakistan and Pakistan's behavior. So as of now, I would argue that Pakistan has an incentive um, to contrib in contributing to a stable Afghanistan, right? It has three million or so uh, Afghan refugees uh, prior to uh, this time. And the UN has asked Pakistan not to close its, its border checkpoints. Um, so Pakistan at this moment has an incentive in maintaining stability in, in Afghanistan. But a worse situation for Pakistan than a civil war in Afghanistan would actually be a rise in, it, in its own domestic terrorism, um, the kind that it saw in the mid 2000s. Right? There are reports that anywhere from 300 to 800 uh, TTP fighters, that, that's 30 Taliban Pakistan, um, fighters that have been released, including uh, Fakir Mohammed from, from Bajar province. He's the Taliban's uh, TTP's uh, number two, reports that he's been released. Um, so Pakistan literally can't afford instability within its borders, especially against the $60 billion or so worth of CPEC infrastructure. Right. The Chinese have made this very clear to Pakistan in the past uh, month or so. There have been two um, where, you know, were kind of positioned as, you know, uh, technical blasts. But, you know, they were, there was some inkling that they were uh, terrorist related or it's a form of terrorism. And there's been, uh, you know, in no uncertain terms, the Chinese have said this is not acceptable to Pakistan. So Pakistan can't afford this type of instability. Uh, within its borders. So if it comes down to it, the Pakistan uh, military establishment will do what it takes to contain that instability within Afghanistan. And this would mean supporting the most capable actor, which by definition almost um, has to be the most violent actor, the ones with the means and ability to both incite violence, but also to quell that violence. So the good news in all of this is that these incentive structures, I believe, are still in flux, right? these incentive structures for extremist violence. And that means that there's room to influence them. And granted in some, some cases it's, it's very limited, but there is that, that room because they're still, still um, malleable in some ways. Um, so my first point about the uncertainty of resources, I don't think there's much that can be done about that in the immediate term. Um, but going forward, any humanitarian aid um, or resource provision needs to be managed very skillfully. Right. It's the work of development professional, professionals and diplomats. Um, I saw um, the Pakistan International Airlines report today that they conducted the first humanitarian aid flight uh, of medicines from the WHO to, into Kabul. So that type of humanitarian aid is, of course, very much needed, um, but it cannot uh, become a new funding stream. It cannot be, um, you cannot aid in incentives, it cannot give to the rising incentives for extremist violence, so it needs to be managed. On my second point, um, and this may be controversial, but I think that the international community should stop uh, publicly demanding concessions of the Taliban. And make no mistake, I, I, I believe that those concessions, especially on women's rights, minority rights, need to be demanded very forcefully um, and be directly tied to any future aid or any type of international recognition. But those demands uh, need to be made in private through back channels, right? We can't give fuel to ISIS-K's narrative of the Taliban being a new, less bearded Afghan government. We cannot allow ISIS to paint itself as the more religious and therefore more credible uh, group in opposition to the Taliban. Um, so this, this religious outbidding that I talk, uh, spoke about, we can't allow that process to actually happen by giving more credibility to those narratives. The Taliban is clearly playing this two-level game, 
of between the international audience and the domestic audience. And if pushed by the international community, if the you know international community forces its hand, uh, I don't think there's any question that the Taliban will go all in on the domestic front. Um, and finally, my third point about Pakistan, um, in order for Pakistan to play a positive role in Afghanistan, I, it needs to feel secure domestically. I don't believe this means throwing more money at the military establishment, um, but I do think it means pulling back on this sense of diplomatic isolation that Pakistan has been feeling, toning down the hashtag sanctioned Pakistan rhetoric. Um, and helping its civil society. You know, it doesn't have to be always a military establishment engagement. Um, you know, working with civil society, NGOs to respond to humanitarian needs, needs of Afghan refugees in the country. Um, engaging with Pakistan's civilian government, particularly um, at the provincial level with its law enforcement, which suffers the brunt of any uptick um, in domestic terrorism. So those are certain, you know, kind of my first takes on how uh, to respond to these um, still, still kind of malleable incentive structures. And I'll leave it there and hopefully continue the conversation in the Q&A. Thank you, Professor Zafar. We now turn to Professor Nick Gazdev. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I thought I would uh, start uh, by looking at what this has been having in terms of the domestic U.S. discussion, both about uh, Afghanistan, but also more broadly, the question of U.S. Uh, engagement in the world, uh, as well as the question of whether or not we're seeing a grand international relations theory experiment uh, play out in real time uh, with regard to the uh, U.S. Uh, and NATO departure from Afghanistan and what this means for uh, regional security uh, and for the, the other major players uh, in the region. Uh, the first is uh, taking a look, and, and Rabia talked a bit about you know, two-level games, that the, uh, that the uh, Afghan, uh, the Taliban are playing a two-level game, uh, and they're aware that there is a two-level game here in the United States, and, and Jim also referred to this, that uh, uh, the termination of U.S. involvement in Afghanistan is something that uh, carries a broad bipartisan support. Uh, the recent polling done by the Chicago Council uh, shows that this is actually one of the few issues on which Democrat, self-identified Democrats, Republicans, and independents largely agree. Certainly, there's a lot of concern about how the withdrawal has been handled, uh, whether mistakes were made both by the Trump and then by the Biden administrations. Uh, a lot of, well, it should have been done better or handled differently. But on the fundamental question of whether or not it was time for the United States to wind down uh, any kind of active involvement in Afghan affairs through uh, the use of the military, uh, this is an issue that, as I said, has broad bipartisan support. It's one of the issues, few issues on which uh, you have agreement across party lines uh, among Americans, that it was time to wrap this uh, conflict up. And even what we have seen over the last two weeks uh, has not really changed the needle. Uh, so subsequent polling data indicates that while there might be some support for uh, prolonging the evacuation, creating conditions for the evacuation to occur more stably, doing more to, to rescue people who might be trapped. The idea of reversing the decisions taken by the Trump and Biden administrations uh, is not something where you're seeing a groundswell uh, of support. Uh, to some extent, I would also attribute this to uh, fatigue. Uh, we have seen this fatigue not only with regard to Afghanistan, but also to two other news items that go beyond the remit of our discussion today, but which are worth mentioning, which is yet another earthquake in Haiti, yet another outbreak of fighting and famine in Ethiopia, and to which uh, the American population by and large uh, feels that uh, the U.S. has done what it could. It offered help. That help was not taken or was squandered or whatever, whatever excuse is prevented, presented. And there's a sense of fatigue of not continuing to provide support 
this may have implications, by the way, for humanitarian aid and assistance uh, that uh, right now Afghanistan is in the headlines. Uh, in a week or two, it may not be. Uh, and the humanitarian crisis that will continue to develop there may not get the level of attention or even sympathy from the American public uh, as we as we pivot to to other issues. Uh, and so this sense that uh, the United States, well, we were going, we should have stayed or uh, that uh, the United States was wrong to leave is not something that I think you're going to see a, a lot of political movement on. I don't think this is going to be uh, an issue in domestic politics. I don't think you're going to be seeing people running next year uh, on the slogan of we should have stayed in Afghanistan. Um, the one caveat being that if there is a, a major terrorist incident in the United States that can be shown to have occurred from uh, Afghan refuges, that would be that would might change that discussion. But as we've seen in recent years, um, you know, terror movements have dispersed, they've become more digital. Uh, certainly the Taliban understands, I think this generation of Taliban leaders understands in a way that their predecessors did not, uh, that uh, the essential bargain that their control over Afghanistan is less likely to be contested if there are no incidents that uh, are traced back to areas under Taliban control in Afghanistan. Uh, may lead to some sort of modus vivendi uh, moving forward. And this, of course, then raises the issue of ISIS-K, also the Haqqani network, uh, which has also not shown in its activities uh, that it respects uh, borders uh, or that it feels bound by borders in, in distinguishing where it, it feels it should carry out its activity. And so this may you know, be something very interesting to see with the, uh, how the Taliban uh, shapes uh, Afghanistan moving forward. At the same time, all of this discussion, well, what does this mean for the United States and for credibility and, and so on and so forth? And that that is a, a useful vein of, of conversation we may want to take in the, in the Q&A. Uh, but one of the related issues to that is uh, how many governments in the region essentially assumed that the United States was always going to be carrying the load or that the United States, when push came to shove, uh, would not actually, in the end, leave Afghanistan. Or we certainly, you know, this was the belief of the Afghan government. Uh, President Ghani, ex-President Ghani, uh, right to the end, uh, still believed that, uh, well, the United States isn't serious, and they see that things are changing, they're going to come back in force, and, and that, that did not happen. But other, other countries surrounding uh, Afghanistan are now dealing with that reality, starting with China, uh, which was very happy to have the United States take the lead in the security mission while it uh, attempted to see what uh, economic, geoeconomic benefits it could gain uh, in Afghanistan itself, but also for its uh, China Pakistan economic corridor, uh, which is a vital part of Chinese geoeconomic strategy. Uh, the question about whether China is prepared to defend its interests by becoming more involved in Afghan affairs, we'll have to see. Um, but uh, in essence, the, the security subsidy that was provided by the United States and its NATO allies and partners uh, in Afghanistan uh, for China has been removed. And uh, whether or not uh, China uh, will play a more active role is something we should uh, continue to watch. Uh, this will be a first major test of uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which uh, brings together Russia, China, India, Pakistan, Iran, uh, the countries of Central Asia, uh, for a number of years, very content to sit on the sidelines and snipe at the United States. You're doing everything wrong. You're not uh, providing security. If only we uh, could step up and, and, and take up the challenge. And essentially, the United States this may not have been a guiding force in the part of the Biden administration's uh, timeline and decision, but in essence, uh, whether deliberate or not on our part, we are responding to that by saying, uh, we are leaving, uh, we have left, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, now's your chance to step up. If you can do a better job uh, of creating a stable framework for Afghanistan and therefore creating a more stage stable regional framework, uh, lots of luck to you. Uh, good luck.
Um, and this, uh, this is why I said this is an interesting test of international relations theory. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, what would it mean for the United States to retrench, the United States to return to being a position of an offshore balancer, uh, to return to an over-the-horizon position in terms of, particularly in this case of Afghanistan, uh, and what would happen uh, for other powers in the region. Uh, now they're going to have to face uh, an Afghanistan uh, where the United States is not going to be the primary bill payer in terms of trying to create regional security. Uh, and it will be up to them to, to decide what they choose to do, what risks they're willing to take. Uh, certainly in Russia, there's a very mixed reaction to this. On the one hand, um, uh, Moscow sees this as a vindication of its view that the United States is uh, losing influence. Uh, on the other hand, uh, now it's up to Russia to decide what it's going to do to try to prevent uh, spillover from Afghanistan uh, into Central Asia and from Central Asia uh, into Russia proper and from Russia proper perhaps into Europe. This was certainly uh, uh, the subject of, of discussions between uh, outgoing Chancellor Merkel and President Putin in Moscow uh, last week uh, is the question of uh, what is Russia going to be doing to, uh, in essence, uh, try to help contain uh, the situation in Afghanistan from uh, spilling out uh, and affecting uh, other countries. Uh, what this means for the U.S.-India strategic relationship is also going to be interesting to monitor. Uh, this may uh, have an impact of reinforcing some voices uh, within the Indian national security establishment uh, that caution about uh, too close of a relationship with the United States, that the United States might be seen as perhaps unreliable uh, or that the United States is only prepared to do so much, uh, and that this is why India should not forego its position of uh, its traditional position of its uh, omnidirectional foreign policy of keeping its ties to Russia, of uh, trying to not necessarily automatically align with the United States against China. Uh, so there may be some uh, some impact uh, there uh, as well. Uh, what this has created, of course, is it's putting uh, the rising powers on notice uh, and perhaps the world as a whole, that the United States, which has been a consistent uh, bill payer for global security uh, for the last 30 years, uh, and we've done it uh, not simply for altruistic reasons, but because uh, we derive some real benefits from it, including this was a way to try to prevent uh, great power rivals from acquiring more capabilities that could then challenge the United States. But in essence, uh, we're saying we're not going to be paying the bills for Afghanistan. Uh, and it's up now to other countries to decide whether or not uh, they're willing to take the risks or whether they're going to step up uh, and do more. Uh, it should also be a warning again to our allies and partners, both in Europe and in Asia, uh, not to make the assumption that President Ghani unfortunately did, uh, based on my read of the situation, that uh, when the United States uh, essentially says that we're going to be pulling back and cutting back on our costs and expenditures, uh, that saying, well, we can just sit back and wait for a crisis and the American cavalry will come riding back over the hills, uh, perhaps uh, to both our European and Asian allies of a greater degree that they should be paying to self-reliance, uh, that the United States may not be completely underwriting uh, their security or regional security uh, arrangements uh, moving forward in the future. Uh, and so what this means for uh, intra alliance relationships, particularly in Europe, uh, as we uh, move towards uh, you know, what NATO will be doing in the coming year, uh, will be quite interesting to monitor. Uh, I think we'll continue to see some of these ramifications uh, playing out uh, for, uh, the, for the foreseeable future and not just connected to what happens in Afghanistan in particular, but what this is saying about the United States rebalancing the role uh, that it's prepared to, to play in the world. So I'll stop with that. Thank you very much. I am going to stop recording now as we transition to the Q&A.